Welcome to this year's special observance of Yom HaShoah. My name is Sandy Breisacher Lessig, and I'm a member of the second generation. This Yom HaShoah observance should have been a social gathering, but in this time of uncertainty and disruption, that could not happen. Instead, we have transformed this event into an online experience and reach out to you from a virtual space. Perhaps you are here to remember loved ones or family members you never knew. Perhaps you want to honor the memory of all those who perished just because they were Jewish. Perhaps you knew a survivor who's no longer with us today. Our hearts are heavy for those precious survivors who have passed away. Later in the service, we'll show the names of our beloved survivors who have passed away since last year's Yom HaShoah. As we mark the 75th anniversary of liberation this year, we think of the last months of the war. As Allied troops moved across Europe, they began to encounter tens and thousands of concentration camp prisoners suffering from starvation and disease and years of mistreatment. Only after liberation was the full scope of their horrors exposed to the disbelieving world. Survivors of the camps, slave labor, and those in hiding had months and years of recovery and emotional, physical and emotional recovery ahead of them. Their reactions were mixed with joy, grief, anger, and loneliness. The 75th anniversary of such a momentous event is also sobering in that we realize that the last of our eyewitnesses are in their later years. The responsibility of memory falls to us. Today, you will hear their words. God, we stand in humility this day to remember the murdered millions of your children who perished in the Shoah. Even in this anxious time where the world reels from a pandemic, we recall the time when the world was turned inside out and our Jewish people were slaughtered. Even as we try to remain safe hidden in our homes, we remember how our people hid wherever they could from a virus of hatred which overtook Europe. Harachaman, merciful one, we are here because even in this hour, we have not forgotten. May our legacy be to affirm the Jewish path of those who were murdered and to affirm the path of life. May we hear the voices that cry out in desperation. May we respond to the pain of those who cry out in distress. And may we, may we stand up to hate wherever and whenever we encounter it. Amen. From Alice Kahana. So when liberation came, we were already dazed. I asked Edith, my sister, what does it mean, liberation? I don't understand that word. What is liberation? What does it mean? She said, free. Repeat it, free. We are free. From Walter Case. We heard the rumblings of tanks and we saw the American flag and the lead tank stopped in front of us. And a young American soldier about 18 years old jumped off the tank and looked at us and started crying. All the tanks stopped. The soldiers all cried. They had never seen such devastation. We looked just like the corpses piled up in Matthausen, just still able to talk. From Mady Deutsch, there was a Jewish capo and her job was to get us out of the barracks and line us up and she counted everyone and then the SS would come again and count again. And this morning she didn't come by and we didn't hear anything there was no morning commotion. We couldn't imagine what had happened. So this capo came out and she didn't see the SS. So apparently during the night, the SS fled. So she ran out to the square right in front of the barracks where we were staying. And she says, 
We are free. The war is over. We are free. It's over. It's all finally over. So we ran out like wild, wild people and we were crying and laughing and hugging and kissing and going through every emotion a human being is capable of. From Wolf Finkelman. And we started walking on a forced march and the people in the towns we marched through just looked at us like we were criminals and they don't give us anything whatsoever. We end up in a camp that wasn't finished and we're sleeping on the ground or on dead people to stay warm. It's like March or April and we get some like soup maybe once a day. One day the Germans just picked up and left. That was when the war ended. People were running toward the kitchen, grabbing food. We went into the German barracks and we slept that night there covered with blankets. In the morning, we walked out from the camp, which was right at the edge of the action. And as we were walking, American soldiers were driving by with the tanks and everybody was so happy to see them. People were still dying from the excitement and the eating. And it was something to see after liberation, to see all the people still dying. The soldiers were throwing candy and food to us and our stomachs were not used to such rich food. That was May 5, 1945. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Warren, chairman of Holocaust Museum Houston. Today we pay our respects to the victims of the Holocaust under very unexpected circumstances. Instead of being together as a community, you're experiencing the program from a computer or electronic device at home. Nonetheless, we can still commemorate Yom HaShoah and mourn the loss of millions of souls. We observe this day to raise awareness and understanding of the Holocaust. It is important for all humanity to remember that such tragedy could happen again anywhere and at any time if we don't learn from the past. Survivors of the Holocaust suffered immensely. They count their victories in survival, in descendants, and in the knowledge that their testimonies will live on in perpetuity. As the son of Holocaust survivors, and as a father and grandfather, it is my duty to keep reminding my children and eventually my grandchildren that the Holocaust should never be forgotten. This was a tragedy that defied comprehension, a tragedy where six million innocent people, men, women, children, and babies were sent to their deaths just for being Jewish. Their dreams and the Jewish communities in which they lived were obliterated forever. It has been 75 years since liberation, and we must take a moment to pay tribute to those soldiers who died on the battlefield fighting to rid the world of Nazi tyranny. We are forever grateful to those brave allied forces, the Americans, the British, and the Russian soldiers who restored peace and freedom as they stumbled upon the camps where so much horror occurred. These soldiers struggled with their initial shock and anger at man's inhumanity to man, but they responded with compassion to what they saw. Many of them could not forget what they encountered and revealed the horrors in their reports, in their letters to their loved ones and the photographs they took. It bears witness to those who dared to deny what happened. I would like to recognize our Houston Holocaust survivors, and their descendants who are watching this streamed event from their homes. 
You have heard their words today describing what they felt when they realized that the horrors of the Holocaust were over. We continue to admire their strength and resilience in moving forward and starting new lives. There is nothing more important to Holocaust survivors than the hope that the lessons of the Holocaust will be taught to future generations. This is central to the mission of Holocaust Museum Houston, to tell of lost humanity, of resilience and survival, and to teach tolerance, courage, and respect for human diversity. We are proud to include the winner of the 2020 Holocaust Museum Houston Yom HaShoah Scholarship, Jay Bahatai. Jay is a student at Kempner High School in Fort Bend ISD. Sadly, we also remember those survivors from the Houston community who passed away since last Yom HaShoah and whose names will appear on the screen. May their memories be a blessing. Before I end, I'd like to thank Bill and Shirley Morgan for their generosity in funding our annual Yom HaShoah service, as well as our community sponsors who will be listed on the screen. Thank you to all the participants and behind the scene folks who put this virtual program together. It is reassuring that people all over the world have come together and will be doing similar ceremonies for Yom HaShoah. Even in this time of uncertainty and disruption, it is important to remember that the past <clears throat> and rededicate ourselves to protecting human rights now and in the future. We must never forget. Thank you for watching this service from your home. It was a time of darkness When hatred filled the land An ancient people scarred by persecution Facing the threat of the final solution but in the midst of this madness There were a righteous few With a kind heart and a noble soul Risking their lives to save a Jew A soul saved is a world it's the spirit of love A life loved means a world loved It's the light from above We will always remember All the goodness in their hearts The soul It was April 15th, 
1945, on the day of my birthday. In the morning, the SS don't yell. They don't holler, rouse, rouse, everyone out. And it's quiet and we don't see any Germans. We hear tanks and trucks and all kinds of things. And we realize that we were being liberated by the British. And they came and started talking to us, asking, what are you doing here? More tanks were coming. The British were here and they were giving us food, flour and potatoes, carrots, onions, meat and chicken we should cook. And we didn't know how, but I will never forget how I celebrated my birthday because my sister and I got two bricks outside and we made a fire and we took our little bowl that fell into the fire. So we threw the potatoes in the fire to cook and they were burned to a crisp. I didn't clean the ashes from the potato, I just ate it. Can you imagine for my birthday to be so jolly, to be free to bake the potatoes in the ashes and dirt and the skin was so crisp and we were liberated. From Yitzhak Zuckerman, the awaited day had arrived, January 17th, 1945. Suddenly, there was a complete silence. Thousands of cannons interrupted the silence occasionally. The Soviets' onslaught had begun. This day, January 17th, was the saddest day of my life. I wanted to cry, not from happiness, but from grief. I am not saying I cried. I am saying I wanted to cry. This was the first time I wanted to. The kissing tank driver, the blown flowers toward them, the joyful crowd, the freedom, feeling, and redemption, and us standing among the crowd, lonely, orphaned, and I know very well that there is no Jewish people anymore. What joy can possibly be? I was devastated. From Linda Penn. The Americans started to bomb very often. Evidently, they knew we were working in an airplane factory. The Germans were running to the bunkers and they decided they would run from the American front. We started to walk through Germany. We walked day and night and in every village we left, the Americans were right behind us, but we were not lucky to be liberated yet. We walked until they could put us on a train, cattle car to Theresienstadt. There were thousands of people and it was an extremely crowded place. So they put us in the attic. Every day there were rumors that the Germans were gonna kill us. So the last day of the war, May the 8th, we were liberated. I remember as I was coming down from the attic, people were screaming, we are free, but I couldn't believe it. The closer I was coming to the courtyard, I saw people dancing and screaming and crying. We are free, the war is over. The gates were open and I saw the Germans running away with no guns and it was just unbelievable to be free. Zachor, remember. Elie Wiesel wrote, in the years of World War II, there was darkness everywhere, in heaven and on earth. Today and every day, we remember those from our own families and those who have no family to mourn them. As I approach my father's fifth yard site, I think about the survivors who came to Houston who are no longer with us. To all the Holocaust survivors, we honor you today and every day. We promise you that your stories will not be forgotten. We promise that together we will fight hatred and injustice. This year, although we are physically distant, we are emotionally close as we mourn together. This year, as we mark the 75th anniversary of liberation, we dedicate our candle lighting to the liberators. We cannot fully express our gratitude to them. Many were young men who had never traveled from their towns. The devastation they saw stayed with many for the rest of their lives. In the words of liberator Johnny Marino, what was so surprising was that Germany was one of the most educated and cultured countries in the world. So we came to one of the most hideous and notorious Nazi murder factories. The precise date 
was March 26, 1945. Everyone was dead. There was no life whatsoever. It didn't seem real. So many people just laying there. I thought I'd seen war, death, Omaha Beach, the Battle of the Bulge, but never, never was I prepared to witness something like Hadamar. I believe that all of us that were there at that time and came back home will never forget this. I know I haven't. I see them today as I saw them then, especially the children. God forbid that in the future there will be men like these that cause so much anguish and suffering to human beings. It's, hum it's inhuman what the Nazis did to the Jewish people during this time. When the Nazis invaded her native Poland, Edith Sternlich Minsberg was 15 years old. That evening, September 1st, 1939, her parents told the children to sleep in their clothes. In the middle of the night, the three girls, their parents and grandmother, rushed to board a train crowded with fellow refugees, hoping to escape the incoming troops. The journey was cut short as the crew had deserted. The Sternlichs walked across Poland for two treacherous weeks with German planes firing from above. Edith and her family were safe in the northern city of Vilno for a while. She even attended school and life regained a sense of normalcy. When the Soviets annexed Lithuania in June 1940, soldiers arrested her family and forced them onto crowded cattle cars. Edith, her sister Erika, and their mother were sent to a forced labor camp in Siberia. Primitive living conditions, starvation diet, hard labor, and diseases. As Polish citizens, they were granted amnesty after an agreement between the Soviet Union and the Polish government in exile. They went to Tashkent and were reunited with Edith's father in Kazakhstan, where Edith was able to finish Polish gymnasium. When the war ended, the family returned to Poland, where they learned that Edith's sister, Herta, her husband, baby, and their grandmother had all been murdered by the Nazis. Edith realized that Jews had no future in Poland. She fled to Munich in the American zone. There, she met fellow survivor Joseph Minsberg. His mother, father, and five sisters had all been murdered in Treblinka. Joseph, in a separate transport, had jumped from a moving train headed for Treblinka. He was the lone survivor of his family. Joseph and Edith were married in 1949. Later that year, they came to the United States, settling in Houston. Married 54 years, they had two children, seven grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. We light the first candle in honor of Edith Mintzberg, in memory of Joseph Mintzberg, and in honor of the Liberators. Trudy Smith's motto is, we are family. Like all Holocaust survivors, she saw families ripped apart and knows what a terrible loss that has been. Gertrude Smith was born in 1935 in Brno, Czechoslovakia, into a middle-class, not particularly religious family. Her father left Trudy, her mother and younger brother during the war. Her mother's resourcefulness saved their lives. For a while, they could pretend they were not Jewish and Trudy went to Catholic school, but that proved to be too dangerous. Her aunts, uncles, and cousins were deported and murdered. Trudy, her mother, and brother, together with some neighbors, survived hiding in a cellar. At the end of the war, she was nine years old. After the war, they lived in Italy, then Israel, and came to the United States in 1957. She and Seymour were married almost 50 years. They had two sons and a daughter, tragically, both sons have died as well. We light the second candle in honor of Trudy Smith and in memory of the 1.5 million children who perished in the Holocaust. Jews and non-Jews risked their lives 
and the lives of their families to save Jews. Most did not see themselves as heroes. It was simply the right thing to do. Monique Ritter was born in Paris, beginning in 1941, when she was only four years old until the end of the war. She was hidden by the Gilbo family in Les Celliers. She was treated like a member of the family, attending Catholic school and going to church each week. The only ones in the entire village who knew that Monique was really Jewish were the village priest and the head nun at the school. Her parents survived, hidden in a small town in central France. After the war, when they came to pick her up, Monique was torn between leaving the Gilbo's house and returning with her parents to Paris. Monique did go to Paris with her family. She, they later went to Israel where she met her husband, Erwin, a Holocaust survivor from the Transylvania region of Romania. They were married for over 63 years. In 2016, Monique participated in the ceremony as the Gobo family received the Righteous Among the Gentiles medal from Yad Vashem. We light the third candle in honor of Monique Ritter and in honor of those brave men and women who did whatever they could to save the Jews. Michael Breston was born in 1931 in the shtetl of Rafaslova, where the Jews had lived from the mid-1600s. He grew up in a warm, extended family most residents of the village were Ukrainians. In 1941, the ghetto was established. Jews throughout the area were ordered to move with only a few minutes notice. One third died along the march, including Michael's grandfather. The next few months were marked by forced labor, random beatings, and killings on the streets. In 1942, the ghetto was sealed. Michael's father was part of a forced labor gang outside the ghetto. In the confusion, they were able to escape. But that day, Michael's mother and younger brother were two of the 2,250 Jews shot and buried in open pits. Michael hid for three or four days with seven people in an attic without food or water behind a false, a false wall that he had helped his older brothers build. He then walked in the middle of the night to the home of a Ukrainian family willing to hide him for a short time. His father, who had been living in the forest, hiding and with a family of Polish farmers, learned that Michael was alive. Together they hid in barns, swamps, and forests. In February 1943, they joined the Russian Jewish partisans near Pinsk, actively fighting the Germans and liberated a year later by Russian troops. Michael was 13 years old. He returned from Rafa but his father was taken by the Soviets to work in coal mines. Very resourceful and with a great ability for languages, Michael spent the next few years working as a businessman, struggling to get an education, and working with the Ossé in France. Michael came to the United States in 1951, eventually getting degrees in engineering and law. He and his wife, Eva, have four children and nine grandchildren, and an infant son who died tragically. We light the fourth candle in honor of Michael Breston and in honor of all those, Jewish and non-Jewish, who fought the Nazis. Nathan Aptekar was born in 1931 to a religious family. He grew, up, he grew up in Lodz, the youngest of four children. Even before the war, he experienced beatings and anti-Semitism. When the ghetto was established, his family fled to his grandparents' home in a nearby village. Life was very difficult. Education was banned, but they were relatively safe until late 1942. The Jews were all ordered to gather for deportation to Majdanek. His father was deported and murdered there. His mother managed to escape 
with Nathan, his brother, and two sisters into the countryside, disguised as Polish peasants. For six months, they stayed in a cramped bunker with little food behind one family's home, and then another five or six months in a hiding place under a barn. They were always hungry and afraid. In 1944, they escaped to the forest, living and fighting with Jewish partisans until they were liberated by the Russians. In January 45, he joined a kibbutz group in Lublin, helped by the Haganah. Two years that included spending Passover in an Austrian jail, learning Hebrew, smuggling guns, and six months in jail in 1948 while trying to get his mother out of Poland. In July 1950, they went to Israel, and his girlfriend, who he married shortly after, where their three daughters were born. Nathan fought in the Six-Day War and later came to the United States, where their youngest was born. We light the fifth candle in honor of Nathan Aptekar and in honor of all the rabbis, teachers, artists, and others who try to sustain the Jewish spirit in those darkest days. Berta Roth was born in Czechoslovakia in 1923 and survived five concentration camps. In 1944, in a crowded boxcar meant for cattle, she was taken from the Ushorod ghetto to Auschwitz, where most of her family was killed. Together with her sister, she was later transported to Frankfurt am Main for slave labor and then faced the brutality of Ravensbrück and Mauthausen concentration camps where her only sister perished. After a brutal death march to Gunskirchen Wells, she was finally liberated by the American troops. Today, she is one of our oldest survivors. Her loving family includes her two daughters, their husbands, four grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. We light the sixth candle in honor of Bertha Roth and in memory of the six million of our people, old and young, men, women, and children who died in the Holocaust. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, may the memory of the righteous be for a blessing. Please rise for El Mule Rachamim. Memorial Prayer for the Six Million. El Mali Rachamim Shochein Bamromim Hametzei Menucha Nechona Tachar Kanefei Hashchina Bemaharol Kedoshim Otehorim Kezor Harakia Mazirim Et nishemot Kol achinu b'ne Yisrael Shemasru nafsham al kidush Hashem Ve'et anashim nashim v'tav שנחנקו ונשרפו ושנהרגו בשואה בעבור שאנו מתפללים ביד הזכרת נשמתם Mesirutam Beyerae Bemaseinu Tohar Libam Vetiena Nafshotihem Zerurot Mitzorot 
חיים, ותהי מנוחתם כבוד. שוב השמחות את פניך, נעימות במנחה הנצח. אמן. וורנרס קאדיש יתגדל ויתקדש שמי רבה, ילמד יברח ירותי וימלך מלכותי, וחיי חון וביומי חון, ובחיי דכל בית ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן קרי וימרו אמן. יהי שמי רבה מברך, ילם על עלמי עלמיה, יתברך וישתבח, ויית פער ויית רומם ויית נעשה. ויית הדר ויית עלה ויית הלל, שמי דקודשא בריחו. אלא מן כל ברכתה ושירתה, תוש בכתה ונחמתה, דם איראן ביומה וימרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיה. וחיים עלינו ויעל כל ישראל ויאמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרמיו, הוא יעשה שלום. עלינו ויעל כל ישראל ויאמרו Sag nicht kein Mal, als du gehst dem letzten Weg. Ist das Himmeln blöd, verstellen blöd. Kommen wird nach unser Eusgebänsche schon. Zweiter beugt und unsere Truten mit seinen da. Kommen wird nach unser Eusgebänsche schon. Zweiter beugt und unsere Truten. Wir sehnen da Von grünem Palmenland Bis weißen Land Von Schnee Wir kommen an Mit unser Pein Mit unser Weh Und wo gefallen Sieht ein Spritz Von unser Blut Sprotzen wird Dort unser Gewurre Unser Mut Und wo gefallen Sieht ein Spritz Von unser Blut Sprotzen werden unser Gewurre, unser Mut. Prayer for the State of Israel, Hatikva. Kol on Maleva Fenima Shehudi Omiya Ulfat Emisrach Kadima Ayin Letzion Sofia Od Lav Datik Vatenu Datik Vavach Not Alpayim חופשי בארצנו, ארץ ציון ירושלים. להיות עם חופשי בארצנו, ארץ ציון ירושלים. Thanks to all who helped make this possible. Stay home and stay safe. Mm-hmm.